All right, so I'm John Footen. I'm from Cognizant. Um, we work as a systems integrator in the media space. And what I'm here today to talk to you about are the business imperatives around the FIMS initiative. So we're going to be focusing today specifically on what is the business case and the business issues and the business solutions that come out of, of FIMS. So to start off, um, let's talk about the current media landscape. And I'm not going to look at my slides a lot. I'm just going to talk to, to uh, what's going on. So as you know, there's been a lot of changes in our industry over at least the last 10 years, if not longer. Um, and those are accelerating. The number of uh, devices that need to be supported by media companies, the number of business models that need to be supported by media companies, and the number of different uh, interactions by audiences that need to be supported are dramatically proliferating. So whereas literally just seven, eight years ago, we only had one linear channel to think about, now we have in most media companies, dozens of channels of distribution that need to be considered when working, um, uh, you know, working with your media. So there's been a, a massive change. And like I said, it's not just that the media itself and the distribution methods that we're using are changing, but also, perhaps more importantly, there's a lot of experimentation in business models, especially for commercial broadcasters, where they're looking at different ways that they can uh, engender revenue streams for their organization. And FIMS is, is one of the methods that uh, we're, we recommend for uh, enabling that. So you need to be very flexible today. If you're a business in the media space, you're going to need to be able to make a lot of changes very quickly. So these are the kinds of things that you're seeing. If you work in the technology or the operations side of the business, these are the kind of things that you're going to see the business is going to be demanding of you in order to fulfill this. So first of all, they need faster speed. Oftentimes, you'll see a senior executives say, we want to put on a new service and we want it to be on air by X date, which is oftentimes only a month or two away, um, and you need to support that. And if you have one of the traditional models of your operations and your technology where everything is very tightly coupled, then you have a lot of trouble in, in achieving that kind of flexibility and rapidity in making those changes. And the speed at which you need to accomplish this is also rapidly uh, accelerating. From the time that a, a piece of content is produced to the window in which it needs to be on another platform, say iTunes or whatever, is dramatically accelerating. People want everything the same moment. And so your need to be able to turn things around very quickly is changing. You also need to be able to support additional metadata, rich, very rich metadata, the new business models um, of how you interact with customers or how the customers interact with the media are requiring a much um, richer set of metadata uh, for people to use. And you also need to provide, they're also demanding uh, a more cogent analysis of what is going on in the business. So all that data that's moving around, the metadata, the data about the viewers, the data about the users, all of that is, is in especially these new business models where they don't know how it's going to work. They need to be able to analyze that rapidly. What else? We have increased need for rigorous management of the data that you have. So the, the first thing that pops into my mind there is, is rights and rights information. You know, if you make mistakes with some of this data, the, the potential liabilities can be dramatic and it's getting much more complex with all of these new distribution platforms and business models. And so you really do need a much more rigorous and much more structured way of handling everything. Um, and you need to make the most efficient use of your resources. Since there's so much more that you have to accomplish, you cannot afford to have a lot of technology sitting idle. You need to have an overall uh, system that is making the best use of both your human resources and your technology at any given moment. And last, I'll say that the, con the contracts, because these business models are often new, the contracts between various partners in the media, media ecosystem are very complex, and you need to adhere to these new requirements. So as I said, um, Let's talk a little bit, let's dive in a little bit more on the, on the multiple versioning issue that we were talking about with, uh, with the content. There's a lot of reasons for those versions. It is not just that there's new devices. That's perhaps the most obvious version. But if 
companies are going on onto an international stage, oftentimes they have to subject their content to different regulatory environments where what is allowed to be done with the content shifts from one location to another. So uh, and, and another example of that is the regional and cultural differences that exist from one place to another that you'll need to support. What this means in all of these things is a massive proliferation of the numbers of content that you need to handle and the numbers of partners that you need to distribute that to. Um, the other requirement that you have to, is in, in order to support that is an integrated digital supply chain. Um, right now, the supply chain of most large media companies is a series of islands. Unfortunately, even today, it is a series of islands usually connected by humans that are making steps happen in the middle, um, who are usually monitoring uh, Excel spreadsheets or Word documents uh, or emails. Uh, very, probably the most common work order mechanism in the industry is the email. Um, and that's uh, not really a, a, a scalable uh, model if you want to achieve the efficiency that we require in these new businesses. So you need a, you need a solid integrated digital supply chain um, for your organization. So what do we have today? And this is, this is the problem I was discussing, and this is, this is widespread throughout the world in terms of the way media companies are today. The resources that you have available are typically locked into an island. So you could have an amazing transcode farm that is in just one part of your business and totally inaccessible to another part of your business, is just one example. You, so you have these resources that are locked all over the place in different, different little islands. Um, those products that you're using are typically proprietary and they have proprietary interfaces, which is why they are locked in that island. It's not easy to integrate these different systems together. And so you, you have trouble making an integrated overall digital supply chain. Because all of those things are in different places, it's very difficult to monitor what's going on. Not only to monitor what's going on with the technology, but what are the people doing in all of those areas? So you're not getting a lot of, of, of information about what's going on in the business. There's also no real link back to the business systems. So the systems that the executives are using to manage the business typically don't have any direct information coming from the technologies that are dealing with the media. There are reports usually generated and those reports are then hand processed usually to get to executives, but the business systems that they use to manage the business are typically not, um, not available for, uh, for, for integration into the technology systems. And because the technology we use today is, let's say, traditional, uh, they're highly reliant on people with traditional broadcast skill sets uh, to achieve what they try to achieve. And that's a difficult problem, as in many regions in the world, the number of people with knowledge of traditional broadcast is in decline. Um, it is not an area where you see um, a lot of potential. So what do we do? That's a lot of problems. And uh, what can we do about all of that? What's the answer? So what are the characteristics of this thing that we need that's going to fix a lot of these problems? Well, first of all, that future platform is going to need to be agile. Okay? The agility of a future platform to change is perhaps its most important characteristic because change is what is bringing most of the difficulties that I mentioned before. If the business models were stable, if, uh, if the media formats were stable, we wouldn't really have this problem. So it's, it's the agility that is probably the most important thing to deal with. Um, because you need that agility, it needs to be a system that has the ability to bring on new services rapidly, quickly, without any difficulty, um, so ease of bringing on new capabilities into the system. And it needs to have a low cost of entry for bringing those things in. It needs to be very scalable. Most media companies are scaling rapidly, um, if nothing else, but because of these uh, increased distribution methods. But there's also things like uh, acquisitions of one media company by another that leads to more scalable problems. Of course, that also creates more islands that need to be dealt with. So we need, we need to be able to be very scalable. And we need to be able to quickly redeploy when one business model doesn't seem to be working out or one of these services doesn't work out. We need to be able to redeploy and use those resources that we've created for something else that's valuable. Um, 
And the other thing that is probably a, a common theme amongst most of the organizations is that capital is in relatively short supply um, and we need to have more of the expense in the operational domain rather than in the capital domain. So the characteristics that we're looking for in our solution include this. So what's obviously the best solution for that is the Framework for Interoperable Media Services, uh, FIMS. Um, FIMS has been, um, uses a concept called service-oriented architecture. So what service-oriented architecture is in summary is that you take a function within the business, whatever that function may be, and you kind of encapsulate that into a service. Whether that function, what you're encapsulating includes people, it may include technology, but it is a service that you can have uh, when, you're, when, you're, when, when you're trying to accomplish some goal. So a great example of a service not in our industry is getting your, clothes, your, your, your coat dry cleaned. Uh, sorry about the mic. <laughs> Um, but get, getting your clothes dry clean. You go to the dry cleaner, you turn over your coat, you hand them a, you, a ticket, a work order, and you come back and they return your coat to you clean. That's a service that's being provided. The same thing can apply to many types of media services. Ingest can be a service. Transcoding can be a service. Um, editing can be a service. Playout can be a service. Uh, you know, there are many services that are, exist in media organizations. So service-oriented architecture is a way of approaching the design of those systems so that they take advantage of this services approach. FIMS is a joint initiative between the European Broadcasting Union and the Advanced Media Workflow Association that has been going on for a number of years now. I forget how many, but it's uh, several years now that we've been in involved in this. And uh, is an attempt to create a framework that allows service-oriented architecture to be applied into the media industry effectively. So this is the concept. We want to take all of the activity that's going on and have some sort of centralization. That's typically called a bus. So we want to have all of the information passing through one sort of control, one sort of uh, information gathering mechanism that's called an, an, usually called an enterprise service bus where you can get at it. So this solves a whole bunch of the problems that I mentioned before. You, you have one place to access all the data no matter where those systems are. It gives you a mechanism to connect those islands, et cetera. We want to reduce the reliance on proprietary solutions. Most of the vendors historically in the, in the broadcasting space or the media space have been using proprietary interfaces into their products, and that's been a big challenge for the industry. And most of them don't have as part of their core business model to have proprietary interfaces. It's just that the lack of standards has resulted in everybody having to create their own. And so we've ended up with a, a plethora of, of individual standards for interfaces. We also need to make sure that whatever we create is going to have standard languages. And that's one of the big things that FIMS does. We have a common framework for how things should communicate. And we also get down into the specific services and say, here's the language you use to communicate with a service. Here's what you tell it, like I said, with the example of the, of the dry cleaning. Here's what you tell it when you want to place an order, and here's what you're going to get back based on that service that you, that you make. So if you adopt FIMS within your organization, what can you expect as a, as a benefit? First of all, you're going to be able to see what's going on a lot better. Since we have this common bus that everything is going through, you're going to be able to make decisions about the operation of your media company to prioritize what is actually mission critical. Instead of everything being in their own island where everybody doesn't know exactly what's going on, you're going to have an overall view that's going to allow you the visibility to make decisions that are going to impact everybody. It's also going to allow for additional flexibility in systems architecture design. And this is really important. What we see in my company's case and in many other companies that have uh, worked with FIMS is a much more rapid integration scenario when you're building, when you're building new systems. You're able to, because of the, the flexibility of this architecture, you're able to more quickly pull together something and that of course saves both money and allows the business to get access to those new capabilities more quickly. Because you have now an overall view, you're, allow, you're able to parallel uh, tasks that you might not have been able to before. So you'll be able to see how many of these things you can get going at once because you're gonna have an overall view of the workflow and what's going on in the facility. 
And of course, that allows for additional scale. The other problem we were talking about, how are you going to handle so many possibilities that you have to do at one time? And the services can be just used when called upon and released when not in use. This is perhaps the, the cloud example, right? So if you're using services that are coming from a shared service pool, when you need your transcoder, you call on your transcoder. When you're done with your transcoder, you can release it, and that allows those resources to be used by some other part of the organization and maximizes the, the value and use of those resources. Um, so what are some of the business benefits? So from the business perspective, a media supply chain that's more responsive to consumers' needs and competitors' activities. So again, that agility. That is, I have to say, the most important thing every media company needs is the ability to react more quickly and effectively. Um, highly efficient production becomes more achievable. As we were saying, your resources are being used more effectively and therefore the, the amount of money you're putting into your, your business can decrease relative to the amount of, uh, of output that you're getting for a given function. And it also supports business continuity. That's another important feature. Services because of this common standardized interfaces can be geographically dispersed. You have all kinds of options that allow you to increase the ability of your business to ma be maintained. And if things change, if there's some change that you need to deal with, because you have a more flexible system, whether it's changing for an emergency or changing for a business model, you have the ability to make those changes quickly. Financial benefits. Well, one of the key ones is that your ability to pilot new services. When I say services, I mean media services for your viewers or your, or your customers. You have the ability to try things much more easily than you would have under the traditional model where things are difficult to get off the ground. Another is a reduced cost in terms of integration. So as I mentioned, it's, it's faster and the speed r results in less resources being applied to the integration of new things and that uh, helps your costs as well. In many cases, services will be more operationally costed than capital costs. Capital costs. That's because in some cases, services can be a shared service where you're paying just an operational expense to, to operate that service rather than building one of your own where you have to buy all this capital. Um, so that helps move some of the, the, the dollars being spent by your organization from the capital side to the, the operational side which many organizations think is important. And it also allows you to use off-the-shelf components. I mean, one of the other things I didn't mention back at the beginning is that FIMS is based on IT concepts that have been around for a very long time in the general IT industry and are also the concepts which can be applied to our industry and also all of the various technologies that they use are also available to us as well. So that reduces your costs. We leverage the big IT guys. Operational benefits. If you're in the operations side, you're able to make those changes more quickly. So when the executive says, I need this done, you have the tools, architecture, et cetera, to get that done more quickly. A migration path is possible from existing workflows. Most of these tool sets that are in the service-oriented architecture space have the ability to have both an existing workflow running in parallel with the new workflow, and over time you can make a change from the existing to the new um, within your organization. The improved utilization of resources I mentioned. Um, human resources are then used where humans are really needed because right now, as I mentioned, because we have all these islands, we have people managing spreadsheets and sending emails and there's a lot of human activity that really could be automated if we just had a better integrated system. Um, and people who are really quite talented are oftentimes spending a lot of time on, on things like managing a, a spreadsheet. Uh, that is really not that valuable. And perhaps most importantly for the future health of our industry, we're able to capitalize on that future pool of IT trained people versus those broadcast people that I had mentioned earlier um, and use them more effectively in our industry as we see the, the ongoing mod uh, transition of our industry to IT. Some specific technology-based benefits. If you're going to go for a fully file-based workflow, obviously this is the approach to take. Um, there really is, if, in my opinion, there is no other architecture or approach to take for a file-based workflow that makes sense independent of the approach that's being taken in here. Um, all other approaches lead to complexity. This one is an approach that 
that values simplicity over complexity and therefore efficiency. Um, using this approach will reduce your reliance on proprietary technologies, proprietary solutions, and that's always a value as well. Um, best of breed designs are easier to incorporate, so if you have a product that's best of breed, if it has a common standardized interface as defined by FIMS or, or whatever, you're able to actually bring that in more quickly rather than continue to rely, because of the difficulties of the integration, continue to rely on something that's not best of breed. Um, the installation and modification of new services is easier. There's a reduced um, intensity or tempo in the IT or technical staff in terms of maintaining this. Um, and it's able, it gives you the ability to test services into the cloud, which gives your organization, once you're able to use this service type model, your organization the ability to have services which are fully elastic. That's the, that's the beauty of the cloud, is the elasticity that, uh, that's seen. So we have a number of companies that uh, are already engaged, and there are actually many more. Um, so I recommend uh, taking a look at our website and seeing some of the options that we, that we have there. So quick summary. FIMS is groundbreaking, that's for sure, but it is very achievable. And I can tell you as a systems integrator, we have used FIMS. It is a very uh, usable uh, technology that can be used by anybody uh, to build new systems in the future. It does promise many benefits in business agility and, 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 and efficiency, and it delivers. There are case studies that are available uh, via the website uh, that this video is on for you to see some of the other options in terms of how implementation of FIMS has given you given real benefits back. And the FIMS activities track the real world. So in other words, we as FIMS people try very hard to look at what are the real problems in the media industry and work on solving those next. But what is perhaps most vital is getting input from viewers and users like you. Um, getting your input into what FIMS is doing um, is the most critical thing that we need. Because we could do many things and we need to know what is the most important things that, uh, that need to be accomplished. And if you need to learn any more about either the business side or the technology side of FIMS, uh, go to www.fims.tv and you'll be able to learn a lot more about uh, the things that we're trying to do. Thank you.